When you retire, you may get a chance to go to football heaven. This is football heaven. Hey guys, welcome to The Mission. I'm your host, Jameer Howerton. And as always, we have an amazing show for you as we conclude our content surrounding Women's History Month. We're so honored to be joined again by another trailblazer and a true pioneer. Connie Nicholas Carberg has had an amazing impact on the game of football. She is and is known and was named the first woman scout in the National Football League while working for the New York Jets, my beloved Jets guys, back in 1976. Connie, it is such an honor to have you here on the mission. Um, I want to learn about your journey. I want you to tell your story to all of the young, inspiring, talented kids that want to get into this league and want to learn about the scouting department. But first, I am surrounded by some amazing artifacts that Connie has had a hand in grading, scouting, and evaluating these players right here, New York Jets legends that have worn these artifacts. Connie, welcome to the mission. Oh, Jameer, it's so nice to, first of all, to see you and to be on this program and with the Pro Football Hall of Fame. It is such an honor. Thank you so much. Connie, it's so good to see you again. Guys, you know, everybody knows, well, if, if, if you know, some of our fans know that I had the golden opportunity of working for the organization for seven years and they got me my start. And let me tell you something, I would see Connie out at training camp and, 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 and it's so amazing that while I knew your story, you never, it, 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 was, it was something that you learned along the way, but I am so blessed to have this platform because I really want to like tell your story today. But first, let's jump in. I got to put on my white gloves here. I got, because you know, these are artifacts, Connie, you know, That's right. That's right. because our, our curator, Jason Akins, thank you very much to him and his team for, for getting all these artifacts um, for us. But um, you got to wear your gloves, Connie. So That's right. Got to keep them pure. I want to start with, first and foremost, this right here. People may not understand, but this brace here is historic. This brace right here not only speaks to your lineage, but can you please tell us what this brace is and what it means? Yes, I'm sure it looks weird to a lot of people. It doesn't look like what you're going to think it is. This is a knee brace, the Lennox Hill knee brace that was made by Dr. James Nicholas when I was 13 years old and both my father and my uncle became the two team doctors for the New York Titans who then became the New York Jets. Dr. James Nicholas, my uncle, Dr. Calvin Nicholas, my father. Dr. James Nicholas was the orthopedist and he was foremost, probably the, really the first sports doctor. And when Joe Namath got drafted, was the big bonus baby, uh, Sonny Warblin, they weren't allowed to examine players and he examined him as, uh, and put chores in the, in the restaurant and said, you gotta be operated on, he had the bad knee. And as a result, he operated, but they did not have a great, they didn't have an ACL per se operation for ligaments. So over time, he had to, he developed this brace. It's a brace that was specifically made for Joe Namath. Uh, Joe Namath wore them on both knees. Eventually people like Dan Marino wore them and John Elway wore them. Joe wore them on both his knees and it, it became famous. And that's the offensive line had to protect Joe because, you know, that's what he had on his knees. And as you know, Winston Hill, the late great Winston Hill, who's going in this year, what a wonderful gentleman on top of it, who was the left pack for protecting Joe all these years with the offensive line to make sure with that brace, he was well protected. Wow. Wow, Connie. So that's just amazing, guys. Did you, <laughs> did you really catch that audience? Not only, not only was this brace worn for Pro Football Hall of Fame with Joe Namath, but Connie's uncle, Connie's uncle, Connie's father's brother constructed this brace here. And like you said, your, doc, your father was the doctor for the New, York, the New York Titans then that later transitioned to the New York yes. Jets. So anything that dealt with common colds, the flu, 
pneumonia, whatever. That's what your doctor, that's what your dad saw the players for. That's what he did in all their families. And, and, and uh, uh, look at me, you know, so anything with the orthopedics, he took care of anything that was going, all the operations. And he, so he was foremost in the sports medicine with Lennox Hill and taking care of all those players, Dr. James Nicholas, so renowned and said, taking care of Joe Namath and keeping him upright all those years. He was magnificent. And that sports brace was really famous. And he also became the man that did the ACL and developed the ACL reconstructive, reconstructive knee surgery later on. Wow. Wow. And that's your family. Well, getting to some guys that I know you're familiar with, and these guys right here, you had a hand in scouting and also grading and evaluating these players. Yeah, I think everybody that knows the Jets knows the famous sack exchange. And these guys were all drafted. We had we got them in, two of them were in 1979, Marty Lyons in the first round, number 93, number 99, Mark Gaston on the second round. And we got Abdul Salam and Joe Klecko. We got in 76 and in 1977, we got them in the sixth and the seventh rounds. And they formed the very famous sack exchange that had, in fact, they and with a little, they got 55 sacks, but that one year we got 66 sacks in one year. More importantly, with that, Connie, I really want to dive in because out of that, these guys right here, you may not see his number, but this is Mark Gastineau. This is the New York Jets all time leading sack exchange monster, number 99. And we have a uh, Mark Gastineau jersey that was definitely donated to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But you personally had a hand in bringing Mark Gastineau and scouting Mark Gastineau and bringing his talents to the attention of, of, of the football minds at the New York Jets. Take us through that. Yes. Um, in 1979, the Jets were going to scout what they call the Senior Bowl. As you know, they had the Senior Bowl this year. Thank goodness they had it because we couldn't have the combine because of the pandemic. And thank goodness Jim Nagy did a wonderful job of being able to put everything together for the Senior Bowl. Back then, we had it also. Walt Michaels was the head coach, coaching the North. Mike Stendrude got hurt. We had to find a replacement. My boss was on the road, and he called me and said, we need to find a replacement in the defensive line. Most of the first and second round guys already were in the Senior Bowl on the North or the South squad. We were coaching the North. So at that time, remember, you have to remember, there's no computers. It's just uh, back then you had uh, these tapes and you got a few tapes in and all you had were reports and you had to just scrounge around and find whatever you could. So I then went and looked to see what I could find. And you know, most of the players were probably going to be around four to seven, somewhere in that area. I read whatever I could, whatever tapes I could find, looked at reports, talked to people. And I narrowed it down to five guys. Most of them were very similar. One was faster than the rest, but from a small school. Otherwise, they were fairly, fairly equal. So I decided to call them. I'm pretty much, I, I think interviews are very important because I, I like players that are passionate and this and that and nonstop motors and different things like that. So I called each player. Most of the players said, okay, I'm ready to play. Maybe, um, when do I have to go to the senior bowl? Tell me more about it. How long do I have to be there? One player said, get me on the next plane. I want to play football. That's all I care about. I love the game. It means everything to me. Hold on. Hung up the phone. I checked to see who that was. And that was the guy that ran a 455 at 65, 280, or 275 around there at that time. But he was from East Central Oklahoma, a small school. But that was Mark Gastineau. But I loved his passion, his attitude, his enthusiasm. And, and everything else being equal, I said, let's go with him. So I told Walt Michaels, and my boss, and, he, and they said, let's go. And he went down to the senior bowl and danced to cannabis was a defensive line coach. And apparently Mark had unbelievable practices. Had a, he got the most valuable player on the North squad. Marty Lyons got the most valuable player defensive on the South squad. And we ended up drafting him in the second round and the rest is history. Wow. That's amazing, Connie. And we'll, and we'll get into it later uh, about your relationship with, Mar with Mark Gassineau to this very day, because I know at the end of the day, he is so truly appreciated for, for those initial talks. Yes, uh, he sure is. And he's, a, he's really a great guy. Great guy. Well, last but not least, we have the New York Jets all-time leading rusher. We have his helmet and we have his cleats. 
no other than Freeman McNeil himself, Free Bird. This is yes. Freeman McNeil's helmet, and these cleats right here are game worn cleats. And Connie, the dirt is from Shea Stadium. Uh, the, our, our true home, love Shea Stadium. It was a and look, and look at that, and look what's on the back. 24 but and free. free free and we love free you know freeman from ucla and it was right. really inter it was interesting i had just met my husband like two years before and i had just we got married and i had to make a decision to leave the jets and that was the draft that i had left the jets but that whole year i was still grading films and doing all and, the, and doing the scouting uh before i had left that, that year so I was still very much into it and, and with the Freeman McNeil thing. And in fact, he was drafted third that year, right after Lawrence Taylor. He was an amazing runner. He didn't, he didn't have blazing speed. He was so shifty, kind of ran like a crab. He was just all over the place. He was awesome to watch. And a, oh, and a first class individual on top of it. But what's so interesting on top of this, the neat story, uh, just to tell you how much and how great the Jets organization was to me. When I left the Jets, I went down to Florida with my husband, and he was starting a new job. At that time, it's the first year they were televising it on ESPN. It had never been televised before. Well, a lot of people didn't have cable. I moved down to Florida. I had no idea I was move, where I was moving. We didn't have a cable TV. And my husband was very understanding about my craziness and obsession and passion with football. And we drove along A1A down there, found a little dinky hotel and said, do you have cable? We found it. They said yes. So I went there to watch the draft, and right before the Jets were making their pick, Mr. Jim Kensel, who was the Jets president at the time, he called me on the phone, and he said, "Kai, I just want you to know because I know how important it is to you. We are taking Freeman McNeil." And I said, "Oh my gosh! I think he would take the time to call me that day. That how much that how much that meant to me, and that he called me to tell me that they were taking Freeman right before they did." Wow, Connie, those are some amazing stories, and I can't wait to dive into your story, but I just want to let everybody know that these artifacts are in our collection now, so please visit ProFootballHOF.com for all of your Pro Football Hall of Fame general information, and while you're there, visit Twice the Fun and 21, where this year we're going to have the hugest enshrinement Ever. Twice the fun in 21, the centennial class of 2020 with 20 new Hall of Famers. And now the class of 2021, one of the greatest ever. Enshrinement tickets are on sale March 5th at profootballhof.com slash tickets. You're coming to Canton. They are too. I'll see you in Canton with the class of 2021. I'll see you in Canton for twice the fun in 21. See you in Canton for twice the fun in 21. Welcome back to the mission. And once again, we're so honored to be joined by the first of the first, the first woman scout in the National Football League while working for the New York Jets, Miss Connie Nicholas Carver. Connie, welcome back again to the mission. We're so honored that you're joining us. And it was great to hear the rich stories about these legends of the game that you had a hand in scouting for the New York Jets. That's cool, but let's go back. I want to learn about your story. Um, Let's go back to your early days, to the beginning, attending the Ohio State University and your love and passion for football. Okay. Well, it kind of started where, as I said, we know now that, you know, my dad, my uncle being the team doctors, I didn't know anything about football when they first started. I knew other sports because I always played other sports. Once they became the doctors, it changed my whole world. And I started learning everything that I could. I had an earth science teacher who was a football coach who went to the games with us and I would stay after school as well to learn football. So that was one way. Then Walt Michaels, who was the defensive coordinator of Super Bowl III, who later became the head coach of the Jets, he was a good friend of my dad's and he was at the house all the time and so was Coach Eubank. And a lot of times uh, my father had his office connected to the house and so players and people, they'd be examined, they'd come up for coffee and cake, or we would have parties, the Jets would have a basketball team in the off season. Just imagine that, to make an extra $50 or whatever it was, because they didn't make much money back in those days. And they were, so I was always learning, and you got to know the players. And then I would watch the games, there was only one game on TV with Keith Jackson announcing. I would learn from that, Street and Smith Magazine, and Bob Hope had an all-American football team on it. And so that's the way I would learn. When I 
the Jets won the Super Bowl my senior year in high school. That was the epitome, and Joe Namath guaranteed it, right? Don Maynard, who's in the Hall of Fame, he had the amazing game in, in Oakland, and he was used more as a decoy because he had gotten a little bit injured. And George Sauer had that great game, and, of course, Joe was unbelievable, as always, with the guarantee, and the defense was magnificent. Everything it was beautiful, and Weeb was amazing. So from there, I went to an all-girls college. They didn't have scholarships for girls, but I played basketball for two years. That, again, Title IX had not started for, for women. There was really nothing for women, but I loved basketball. But there was something missing. So I decided to transfer, and that's when I transferred to The Ohio State University. Best, best move I could have made. And I loved it, and I was in a sorority, and I was doing things, and I, I majored in home ec and dietetics because you had to choose something, but that wasn't my passion. My passion was still sports. I didn't know what to do. So one day I went over to the student union. I knew that's where the football team was. And I waited till Coach Woody Hayes, who was a very famous coach, kind of like Nick Saban and a lot of the coaches are today. And he came out and I started talking to him. And he said, you know, you really love, you have a passion for the game and you really know it and love it. Come on over to the stadium one day and, and we'll talk. So, of course, I took him up on it. I went over and we talked and he said, you know, there really isn't anything at this time. There were no women reporters. There were no women announcers. There were, there really were, there was nothing really for women. The Phyllis George hadn't even started in the NFL today at this point. And this is, right. had, I don't know, this is 1971 to 74. And title IX was like 72, 73. So it was just about them. So he said, it really isn't anything at this point. But don't give up on your passion. Keep doing it. You never know where life is leading you. Just keep with it. And I want you to come to every practice, whether it's closed to the scouts or open to them or anything. You are always welcome here. No matter what, talk to the scouts when they come here. Learn. Do whatever you can. You're welcome to talk to everybody. And no matter what. And that's what I did. I said, I said okay, my, my friends, my sorority sisters all helped me with my school work, and I went to football practice. <laughs> so that's the <laughs> My Zeta sisters helped me out. So I did that. And after I graduated, I thought I was, I did, I had a teaching job at Babylon High School where I was from Long Island. And that's what I was going to teach and then coach girl sports. Mm -hmm. But then my father had a 50th birthday party. Charlie Winner, who was the head coach and Lee Bank's son-in-law, was there and I was table hopping, talking to people. And he saw, he said, he saw how much I knew about football and how much I loved it. Again, my passion and all this stuff. And he said, you know, we're building a brand new complex at Hofstra University. And he said, we have a city office, but I, I want to have brand new people. And he said, you, have, you, you seem to love the sport so much. Would you consider working there? And I went, are you kidding me? I said, oh, I don't care what you pay me. I don't care what time you want me there. I will be there. And that's how it began. So it was the answer to my dreams. I was so blessed. I was, when I first went in, I was the only girl there. So I was the receptionist and the secretary in scouting and the secretary to everybody in the whole mm -hmm. building, except I didn't know how to be a secretary. I didn't know how to type. Because in those days, you either went to college or you went to secretarial school. One of the challenges I had. And so I had to kind of fake it. But thank goodness, they didn't care how many words per minute I could do. They cared that my attitude and my passion and that I was willing to learn because you didn't have Google to say, how do you type or how do you, uh, what's the proper way to do a form letter or anything like that, but you learn. And the players, it was a very uh, relaxed atmosphere back then. You could go and uh, talk to players. You can go back there. If somebody called on the phone and wanted to talk to a player. I went back to the locker room and I would yell, go back and go back there and then bring a player up and they would talk on the phone. I would make apple pies for Joe Namath. I would, you know, it was a different world back then, I must say. And it was great. Go to practices. I, so I was doing scouting, receptionist, so I would get to know everybody on the phone because you didn't have a secretary or in, in, in between. So that's how it all began in, 1970, wow. in 1974. So 1974, but two years later, 1976, your life would change. You were then, and, and talk about who stepped out and who saw that growth, that talent, from the day you walked to the door to that two-year mark in 1976 when you were officially named the first woman scout in the National Football League. 
it's really amazing. Yeah, because 1970, I was doing all that. And in 1975, when Al Ward was general manager and Mike Hollaback, who is a G, was a genius as a director of player personnel. He was a running back coach. He was an All-American at Boston College. Uh, he coached the Patriots for many years. Um, they were my, he was my boss and, and Al Ward. And we were in the draft room. And the draft was 17 rounds at that time. You know, he went from 17 to 12. Now we have seven. But it was 17 rounds. And everything was done by hand. You had no computers. There were no pre-draft physicals. In fact, the 75 draft was done in January. So you're sitting there, we got to the 17th round, and they turned to me first and they said, would you, uh, you're gonna make the pick, Connie. So I'm still the only female that actually made a draft pick. And I chose Mike Bartosik out of Ohio State, who was a wide receiver tight end. He didn't make the team, but he wasn't one of the first ones cut, so I'm still very proud, but still, that was really amazing. So from there, um, and I started going out to practices. They let me go to all practices, and Mike Hollaback taught me a lot. Mm. So he was one. Lou Holtz, when he was in, came in and spent a lot of time learning a lot from him as well. And he had coached at Ohio State, so we had a bond. He had coached with Woody Hayes, so we had a bond. So, again, all those guys there. Then, of course, when Walt Michaels came in, they had the bond, the bond there. But, as I said, Al Ward was the one, along with Mike Holovac, who then in 70 were the ones that came to me and said, we would like you to actually do scouting. We're going to send you out to Ohio State, down to the Orange Bowl. I want you to do uh, Boston College. We're going to have you grade films, interview players, uh, call players to bring them in, which was hard to do at that time because uh, people were scattered all over. And that was a real challenge to find people and bring people in. Um, if they, they didn't do pre-draft physical per se. Sometimes they had to go and find a player to talk to them. Uh, that didn't start happening. The Jets were the first team to actually bring players in, but that was not until about 78 or 79, they brought 100 players in. That was the combine, that was like the preliminary before the combine started. And we brought players into the city and they were examined and we interviewed them. But in 75 and 76, they didn't have that. And even 77. So that's how it all began. And then I started grading films and interviewing and going to the schools. And of course, when I went to Ohio State, Woody Hayes gave me carte blanche to everything. <laughs> now, Connie, I, you, you, you gave us a lot of content in there, but I, I, I have to go back and I would re be remiss because I really want to pay homage to the fact that you actually, you actually handed in, you actually picked the player. The, that team, that, yes. that's what I'm talking about, breaking through the ceiling, Connie. You broke through that glass ceiling and they actually said, Connie, who are we going to pick? Yes. What was, what was that moment like for you? You know, it's so funny. I never, I didn't expect it. And I didn't know it was a big deal up at the time. I didn't, I mean, I guess I thought, wow. And I was like, whoa. But afterwards, I didn't realize all these things were that big. Till many, even the part of being the first female scout, I did not realize how big it was until probably 12 years ago. When my son decided to say, Mom, you know, what you did was really big. And he made my website saying, you were the first female scout. And we put, the, you know, put all the stuff. I said, I didn't know it was that big, honestly, because for 40 years, nothing happened that much after. There was um, Linda Bogdan in the 80s. She did a lot of different things. She did some scouting for the Buffalo Bills, um, Ralph Wilson's daughter. Right. After that, there really was very nothing uh, as far as women really doing scouting per se. And now, of course, the doors are really open. So um, once you start having technology and podcasts and all the different things and websites and things, everything just exploded. I didn't know I was going to have this big explosion and rebirth and that what I did was so big. I, it was uh, such a passion. And it was something that I felt so comfortable doing and talking and living football um, that it, at the time it was just, something that I did. I didn't realize how big it was. You were like a little kid in a candy store. I can only imagine all the reports that you were giving and just doing your due diligence. Because like you said, nowadays, you know, you want to scout a player X. You can go Google because a lot of guys make their own highlight reels. Yes. But take us back to all of the information that you were reading and, and, and the true essence. Because back then, it was like the 
how can I say it? The, 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 you were really digging in the crates, if you will. You were digging deep on players because like you said, there wasn't Google. There weren't, you know, going to YouTube and like really studying players. You really had to dig deep to find a Mark Gastineau. Yes, it was very, very different. You really had to either, you know, when people went to school, they either had to really talk to, you know, really get to know the trainers or different people. When you went to the school, you had to, when the tapes came in, you looked at them and, and you had to send them on to another school and you didn't, you did not have, as, as you said, YouTube, Google, all the different heights and weights. They didn't have all the pro days. They didn't have, right. the, when I was there, they didn't have uh, the combine. But the Jets, as I said, were ahead of the game in 1979 by bringing those 100 players in and interviewing them into New York. That was the first time that had been done in a group and then doing the interview and then doing a pre-draft physicals and deciding certain guys that you might not, you might take off the board or be a little bit more wary of and stuff. But it was it was a very and you didn't have the computers. You couldn't say who's left at six foot two, two forty, and run the four six forty from the school, you know, and the wonder lick tests and who ran on grass and who ran on astroturf. And right. all these so you had a you did you had to do and a lot of a lot of digging and did you know an assistant coach at that school um and stuff and you know what to this day it's funny you still you have so much more information but you st it's still an inexact science and you still can't measure the heart you still can't measure a lot of these intangibles people make just as many mistakes now as they did back then because it's really it's not that wow. easy Wow, that's amazing. So uh, it, it, a big shout out to the New York Jets because, you know, to know that not only they were tr they were blazing the way of, of, of giving you this amazing opportunity, but also, too, being ahead of the curve with the combine. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, after talking to Pat Kerwin, who oh, is yes. um, oh, he's who is awesome. all time player personnel scout for the New York Jets, fantastic. also on Sirius XFM radio and he's a he you know he really broke it down to me and Gil Brandt who was a pro football hall of famer oh. took us through that whole essence of like that's, you know it really started as like you said a medical that, that that's where it started you know bringing players in the combine we're talking about and pulling their arms pulling their legs making sure that you know the investment of these players that these teams are going to obtain that these guys are in good medical health and then it was a scout like yourself say you know what let me see how high you can jump. Let me see how fast you can run. And then now it's like an NFL brand. You it know, is. the NFL Combine is a huge brand. It is. And you know, like what you were just saying with Gil Brandt, because even when I was at the Jets, the Dallas Cowboys were also, they were ahead of the game as far as computers. We all knew, you know, nobody else had really, our, like our pro personnel was venturing into it. But the college wasn't quite there yet when I was there. But the Dallas Cowboys were ahead. Bill Brandt, he, he was. He, I mean, amazing. Amazing. Let's, man. let's talk about some of the challenges that, that you faced over your career, because I can only imagine being the first of the first, a pioneer, a trailblazer, breaking through the glass ceiling. But then here comes Mr. Leon Hess at that time, the majority owner. Take us through some of the challenges that you faced along the way of your career that you never let it be a setback to you. You never took it that way because you just kept going very interesting point to me because you know here I was going along and things were going along very well right mm -hmm. and we had we had a bunch of owners including a woman owner and this is uh, Ellen Dillon she was a 25% uh, owner along with we had four owners at, at the time after uh, we had uh, Mr. Islin um, and we had uh, her, her her dad had passed away so she took over and then you had and Mr. Hess and then Townsend Martin so each one had 25% and then they eventually sold and then Mr. Hess became the sole owner. When he did, um, after I was doing stuff, and he was an older gentleman, wonderful gentleman, but you know, from a different stage, and you gotta remember this was way back in the 70s. So when he Mr. Ward had to come to me and say, Kanye, you, know, you can still go locally, you can still grade, you can still uh, do uh, grade films that you're doing, um, and you're gonna be able to interview the players when we brought them, they brought them out for the uh, to, to Lennox Hill and to, for the interviews and all that kind of stuff and talk with them on the phone, whatever you had to do. He said, that's going to, that's going to be fine. All that stuff. Because Mr. Hatch really didn't want a woman to be the representative flying all over. 
And I said, you know, and it could have, I probably could have said, gotten really upset and said, you know, how could, but first of all, <clears throat> it was a different time. It was in the 70s. Secondly, I look, I love, my passion was the Jets. My passion is football. And I looked at the big picture, I guess. What did I, what, why, for something small, and I still got to do what I wanted. Am I going to, am I going to give up something that I love so much, which is being with the Jets, and being in football for something to throw it all away? No. And you know what? If I had done that, I would not have had the opportunity because the thing with Gastineau came after that. Mm. So sometimes you're on, sometimes you're on the road and you think you, you know, you're on this road, you think you know where you're going and you don't know where you're going because you don't know where it's leading you. And you may, I, you know, being too strong and not seeing the whole picture, you may throw something away that could be further down the road. That is really, really good. And so, you know, I, as I said, I look at the whole picture of, of this is my passion. This is what I love. I'm not going to throw this away for something little like that. And that's how I kind of look at it. Wow, Connie, that <laughs> that is so amazing because the, the the inspiration that I'm drawing from that story is exactly what you're saying. It's like, don't look at something so petty. And like you said, at that time, let's just face it, it was narrow-minded. It is what it is for that period of time. And it was understand, yes. yes. And it was understandable where you, you know, where you were, where people were. It's, it's right, where people were. Yeah. You I mean your circle is this big, and as you get older and you grow, your circle becomes bigger. So yes, it, it, it just it's the limited amount of experiences. But if you had have left that, like you said, no telling what we would learn today. Exactly. None of these no things. No telling, were, no telling, you know, Mark Gaston, no, no telling. No, exactly. None of this stuff no would happen. Telling. That all came afterwards. And I love, I love football. I love the Jets. And the Jets still treat me like family when I go there. I go up three weeks every summer. I have 55 years in a row, even after I left the Jets. And they treat me from after, after Mr. Hess left. And he was always good to me. And then both, you know, both Johnsons, you know, both Chris and Woody have been unbelievable to me. And, you know, all the people through there have just been have treated me like family. So, uh, as I said, I've been so blessed. So, as you, you know, I try to always say, look, look at the big picture. Thank you for that lesson. Thank you for that lesson. I think a lot of younger people who are coming in today's game need to really look at that. The big pitch. Don't get caught up in, you know, right here. People sometimes have their blinders on. But with that being said about connected to today's game, how, how happy are you to see the way the Jets are moving, not only with their new head coach, but free agency, and soon to be, we're going to see how it goes with the draft. Yeah, this is really interesting. You know, it's very different. We know um, with Joe Douglas, I, I love it. First of all, the, and with Joe Douglas, you know, he, he is his own man. He doesn't let any leaks out. We have no idea what he's doing. And I love the way he's doing things. We, nobody can figure it. And I love the way he's doing it. And he was an offensive lineman. So he really knows what's, what's important. And the I smartest man in football. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. And he, and he learned from the best in Ozzie Newsom. So you can't learn from much better than that. <laughs> he was there a long, long time. So I think that's great. And after that, he was Robert Sala again. From what I've seen with Robert Sala from the 49ers, passionate, enthusiastic. You know, I love that kind of person. So I'm really, and the two of them, I'm just seeing the kind of people so far that they've signed. Every person is passionate, enthusiastic. Every person from the Justin Hardy, even the special team guy, when he, they asked him why is he good on special teams, and he stood up and he goes, because of this, you know, his heart. And he said, I, you know, I play for my mother. And I play, who's up in heaven watching, and I play every down. And you hear every single player that they, that they signed. Um, and you can see the defensive linemen that they did, whether it's Rankins, whether it's the linebacker Davis. And, and then all the different, and then the offensive players that they also got. So I'm very excited about that route. Now, I don't, in the draft, <clears throat> I'm very, you know, waiting anxiously to see. I mean, we, we need a lot of stuff so to, to rebuild. And I don't think it's going to be finished this year. It's definitely another year. I have no idea what they're going to do with the quarterback situation. And I just have to wait and see. I really don't know. But I'm very excited. 
Connie, I got to ask you about your technique as being a scout, because I like the I like to learn because a lot of people may not know. But right now is really the time where the general manager and his team, it, it, it's pretty much your season, if you will. The GM, the player personnel, the area scouts, the college scouts. Um, you guys are really putting together the team right now, preparing for the coaches to do their job with the mini camps and training camp and getting ready for the season. But as a, as a scout, when you're observing practice, when you're observing players, you know, what, what do you watch for? What, what, what is, what, what, what is, what is Connie's and you don't have to give it to us, but, but, but what's your secret sauce? What are you watching? I'll tell you, it's very different now. In the old days, it's funny, in the old days before the CBA, I'm being honest with you, before the CBA in 2011, <clears throat> when they used to have two a days, I could watch. You know, you can ask Jack Cascad, and I would pick him out. He always last. I said, oh. you know, he, he, guys, I always like to find the guy that isn't a number, a first or second round pick. I like to find the guys that <clears throat> aren't the ones that you think are going to be the superstars and, and see if they see if they come out who's giving everything he's got, who's showing something, you know, that you didn't expect um, every play out there all the time. Um, and you could see that all the time because when you had two a days and when they were hitting. Since, this, since the new CBA and they can't, they take the guy all the way to the ground and they're hitting dummies instead of people half the time. Um, they have one practice. I have to admit, I go out there a lot and I can't tell you half the time I, I've had the time, I'm, I'm wrong much more of the time now. I really, it's just not the same. And of course, now they, don't, they didn't have the preseason, they don't play the preseason. It was a lot easier, I, uh, I'm just being honest with you, before pre CBA for me to judge who is a player. Um, because wow. the guys, especially guys that are undrafted or lower draft picks, because they don't get that chance to shine, especially on special teams, you know, and stuff like that. That you should be able to see them, see them, and watch them. Now they come down, and they have these, uh, these dummies standing up. That's not the same thing as hitting people. Right. Got you. So, now, so, now, now, when you would go to a college, when you would go on a road trip, and you were scouting said player, what were you watching at, you know, what were you watching about that player during college practices and so forth and so on? I, well, I was watching, it would, it would be depending on who I would scout, you know, and the position. Um, if you were walking, how we, if you were, if you were walking, if you were block, I'm blocking on the offensive line, you're watching, you know, hip movements, you know, for, hips are always a key, looseness, tightness of hips, change of direction, um, that kind of thing. Um, uh, speed, I mean, we always, we speed, we always, we want, of course, um, but, uh, it all, as I said, it really depends on that. Now, of course, the biggest thing is, the biggest change is in quarterbacks. Mm. Very different. Up until five years ago, quarterback, the first thing you wanted was, can he stand tall in the pocket? Can he take a hit with a pass rush coming in his face? Does he throw, when he throw you know, does he throw overhand with a you know, quick release, overhand, you know, can he, take, can, he, can he take a snap under center? All those different things. You know, this is what you're looking for. Now, the first thing is, can he extend the play? All right. Is, is he an athlete? Um, can he can he throw from uh, from different angles? So it, it, um, now it's what fifty or sixty percent is from the shotgun, so it's not quite as important under center. So very different quarterback in the past five years is completely completely different than what you judged a quarterback before. So um, the, the in my opinion, the pro game has become much more of a college game and has absorbed the college game than it used to be. It used to be, it took a lot longer for quarterbacks to make it because they had to become into the pro game. Now the pro game has become a lot more in the quarterback realm like the college game. Wow. Are you, are you impressed with the way these quarterbacks now are kind of, no disrespect, I'm not going to say a running back, but I had opportunity, case in point, I had opportunity to talk with Pro Football Hall of Famer Thurman Thomas. And he gave us his top five running backs. And within his top five running backs, his last running back, if you will, he says, you know what? I may catch a lot of flack for it, but I'm a Hall of Famer. And this is my list. He listed Lamar Jackson as a running back. 
That's what I'm saying. Yes, and it's very, it is really different because you know I feel so badly for the running backs because they are devalued to some degree. And now, mm. in fact, the other day I was just doing a little study in the seven in the seventies to the eighties. The, there was a running back was taken in the top three picks almost every single year, you know, whether it was Billy Sims and Earl Campbell and Tony Dorsett, I mean, you can go down the list. And now, when you, if you say other than, you know, um, Saquon Barkley, other than that, you, that's, you just aren't looking at running backs in the, you kind of say, oh, you don't want to take them in the top, you know, five picks anymore unless they're this, Anymore, but if you look at the '70s and '80s, the quarterbacks were not. The, you might you might take one quarterback in the first round, and maybe and I looked a lot until 1983 when you had that big year, of course, with Eason and and um, Marino and Blackledge, and Kelly and O'Brien. But up until then, I was just doing a study on that yesterday. Wow! Very, everything has switched. That's amazing. That's amazing. So. I, I, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about this year because I read that you had broke your 55 uh, uh, mark of training camps. Is that what it is? Because yes. I know with the, with, the, with the COVID and everything like that. Oh, that's the only <laughs> it, messed up, it messed everything up. But, 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 but with that being said, how impressed and how happy were you with the way uh, Commissioner Roger Goodell was able to still keep everything together and we were able to enjoy football, a Super Bowl, and I know there was a lot of moving parts, but when you look at the way the NFL handled this past year, it's like you have to oh, salute the league. I'm telling you, I, I have said this to so many people, because last year, when things were, you know, when at this time last year, we had just about nothing. This time right. last year, as far as sports, whether it, was, whether it was March Madness, whether it was spring training, you know, well, you, know you can go down the list of everything, it was just nothing. And what, as I said, how Roger Goodell started, first of all, he said, we're not changing the date. And the way he did the draft, with the uh, virtual thing, and the way they came up with that whole thing for all the teams, and everybody in the boxes, and did that whole thing. He did that. And the OTAs, how they figured out they were doing the OTAs. Unbelievable. Then Unbelievable. They, then they did the, you know, uh, the actual practices before the season, even though they couldn't have games. And then to get the whole season in, you know, and it's not like you have 15 players. When you have to have, you start out with 90 or 100 players and you get down to the 60 or players plus staff, you know, plus what, 25 coaches per team and staff. So you've got about probably 150 people per team that you've got to figure out for all those games to do that whole thing and travel, hotel. I just, I, I was just blown away by the way that Roger did that whole thing and on time getting it done and the Super Bowl uh, I just he was to be commended you know um, not to you know the NBA commissioner always gets all the accolades but Roger Goodell deserves all the accolades on this completely he just totally agree totally uh, agree on a much totally tougher agree. on a much tougher job Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, Connie, I want to switch gears a bit because with your inspirational story and your story touches so many people, what, what, is, what, what are the words of wisdoms that you share with young, talented, bright stars that are trying to come in and break into this industry, male and or female? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, get, I do. I get a lot of, I get a lot of uh, DMs, a lot of emails, and I have for a bunch of years. You know, people, well, one thing, you know, they never had when, of course, I was younger or anything like that. A lot of schools, like I've spoken at Florida State and USC and a bunch of schools, um, they, they have all the different uh, sports management, all those different things. So, and part of their school thing is you do internships. Um, and that's part, that is part of the whole curriculum, which is great. And so you go there and you can learn, you can go there and whether it's in PR and community service and whether it's, in, whether it's in scouting, um, you know, whether it's in um, strength and conditioning, training and coaching, I mean, all different stuff now that you never had before. And you might try something and, and, and all it takes is one person, I always tell them, one person to say, oh, I like what you are. I like the job you do. And and then, then it's a small world in the NFL or in college football or high school. And don't be afraid to start small. Everybody wants to start at the NFL. You can't always. You know, sometimes you may want to scout 
do your own little reports on high school or whatever it may be if you want scouting. And you learn a lot in those kind of things because not everybody can start at the top. But whatever you do, just don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go whole hog. If it takes one person, it takes a liking for you. It's a small world. This person knows that person who knows that person. But everybody has a resume now. Everybody's got a degree. So you have to have something, I tell them, that sets you apart. You, have, you need something that says, the person says, wow, what a great work ethic, or what a passion, or this person is really genuine, or they really treat everybody with kindness, whether that person can help them or not. <clears throat> so that's what I always just try to tell them, you know, but don't be afraid, nothing is beneath you. Mm. And I thought the um, Sarah Thomas you had on last week, and I thought that yes. was so, and I really loved too what she said. She said, don't do something trying to become the first. Do it because you love it. Even if you're starting out in Pee Wee or in high school or in college or whatever it may be, because you love it. Like she did 10 years before she got where she was. Right. I thought that was just awesome what she said. Right. And, and I think that's the thing, you know, not to prove a point, but because it's genuine um, and it's really what you love. That's the, you know, and, and, and don't be afraid to try something new. You know, it's, it's two lessons I learned today. today. Early lesson of, of staying the course and not letting minor setbacks set you back because you don't know what the road and what the creator has for you ahead. And then yes. also, too, when you have good intentions and your intentions and your heart is aligned of learning the job, learning the craft, working the craft, like we talked about, digging into the crates because of the limited resources at that time, um, really just lets you know that you and Sarah were not trying to go out being a trailblazer. You didn't come into this trying to be a pioneer. You wasn't looking to be the first of the first. You guys love what you do and yes. still love it. And that's like, wow, like, all the other accolades and that stuff, it'll come. It'll yes. come. But it does. It's, 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 I just see your passion. And I, like I said, I, from afar, me running around as a little kid and being a ball boy, you know, I always see Kanye at camp, but not really totally understanding. But here it is. You're picking my heroes. Here it is. You're evaluating these guys. Here it is. You're talking to the head coaches and the general managers. Never really had a clue. Never a clue. Like, Hi, Connie. You know, Mr. Hampton would say, hey, make sure you get some jet gear for Connie. She's leaving to go back on the road. Going on the road? Okay. What do you mean? I, I didn't know. You know, but but it's just like, so like I really appreciate this rich story of just learning of just do the job, learn the craft, all that other stuff will come. You know, and with that being said, your legacy, the mark that you have had have had led on this and i'm quite sure there's still more that you want to get accomplished but how do you want all of that to be remembered connie wow well, how do i want it to be remembered um just you know as i said i, I i'm first of all I, I don't know what i want to remember i just want everybody to to do what feels good for them you know what what is right for them um mm. that is you know I, I said i feel like with the, so many women today they have Flag football, they have tackle football, they have so many more opportunities. The door is so much more open to them right. that you know that they can find it. Um, what I did was just part of my life and what I wanted to do. So, as I said, I what I love to do is I'm on Twitter, and I'm, if I can share my joy and my experiences and my love, that's what I enjoy doing. With people and connecting with people that way, and seeing that the, the sports world is human and fun and good and just I, I guess you know people love to connect and if i can try to help people that way like say somebody writes it says is there a way to get in touch is there a way to do something can you help me in some way and i think that's what i want to be able to do just help people in any way that i can well with that being said how can people follow you on twitter Okay, it's at Connie Scouts, and you can follow me there. Um, I have my website at Connie Scouts. And, and uh, yeah, and, and also, too, see, Connie is, see, guys, this is what I love about Connie. She's just so humble. 
But Connie, also, you're an author of the book. Tell us about that and where people can get your publication from. Yes, um, this was, was amazing that came out of this also. <clears throat> a girl contacted me that I didn't even know either. She and it said, could you write a book about my whole life? Uh, Elizabeth Meineke, and she, and she had the same philosophy. I didn't, um, I had a great life and I've been very blessed in my life. And I don't have, I know some people have some terrible experiences and I've just been really, so I wanted a positive book for young ladies, for Jet fans, for football fans. And she had a similar, you know, she didn't want this gossipy, tell all negative thing. So she, it was called X's and O's, Don't Mean I Love You. And it's on Amazon. And you, it feels, it, you'll see it at the top of my uh, website, the top of my Twitter page and stuff like that. So it's, it's on Amazon. And uh, so it, it's just a nice, easy, like you're sitting by the pool <laughs> when the weather gets nice, <laughs> read if you want, or you're stuck inside with that or whatever. But it's just a nice, easy uh, and football read. Wow. Wow. Connie, I want to thank you so much. And uh, once again, we, we're going to celebrate the legacy of 2020 uh, class member Winston Hill, offensive lineman of the New York Jets, who you had a hand in uh, actually scouting and evaluating his talents. And along with class member of 2021, now I know Alan Fanica is, is a Pittsburgh Steeler through and through, but he did yes, spend some time with the New York Jets. And those guys, as you know, it, it doesn't matter what team they're on. You know, if they play 17 years here, three years there, it's, it's what they bring to those organizations and their lasting legacy. It is. And, you know, I give them a why. They don't come out. And I, I knew Kevin, even though he came after me, and I was the best pulling center that I've ever seen in my life. And it's just and what a wonderful gentleman on top of it. And, of course, Curtis Martin, they don't come in. And, and we also know, as I said, with Garth Joe and Reeve and, and Don, so just great. And, and I was so lucky that I had a, a great husband, 40 years, who just understood my craziness and my passion. And I've got a son who loves the Jets. As, so that's a big, huge victory. And a stepdaughter who does too. So I said, I've been, I've been very, very blessed. Wow, Connie. And we have been blessed with your presence right here on the mission. Connie, give it up for Connie Carberg. Thank you so much, Connie. We appreciate you being right here on the mission, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, Jameer. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And oh, one, last, one last thing. Do you have one more minute? Of course. Just one more thing. I just want to say the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Football, you know, is fleeting. It's, there's a lot of stuff that goes fast. And you're, as I said, not for long, different things happen. The Pro Football Hall of Fame is the one thing that is forever. You don't forget these people. They are forever enshrined and you get to see people. And history is so important. So that's what's so important. I wanted to say thank you to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Thank you so much, Connie. Thank you so much. <laughs>